some way, shape, or form, especially when the Jobs Act was introduced. Uh, we've talked a lot about crowdfunding over the past couple of years. And so what we want to make everyone aware of is that all these videos are actually posted out on YouTube and are available. So if you want to see any of this background information, that's all available to you. And today's conversation is really going to be around the tactical side. You know, how can we bring money into our projects? How can we bring money into our businesses and be able to do so efficiently and not get in trouble along the way? Because uh, that's the bugaboo, right, with our, with our existing laws, rules, and regulations. So we stacked the decks today and gave you a heavy dose of legal expertise here. So please, please tap into it. I'm going to do quick introductions. I'm going to run through a few slides. I'm going to let these guys give some history and background. Because if we're going to talk about the future of finance today, we have to understand also where we've come from. So we're going to take the first five minutes to, uh, to do that. So before I get into the heart of it, hey Gordy, um, I'm always curious, why did you come here today? What, what were you hoping when you saw this, the title of this presentation, what were you hoping to learn? Because I want to make sure we're addressing all your questions and this is really a dialogue. This is a mini bar. This isn't a presentation. It's a dialogue. So, what, uh, what did you hope to get out of today? Yes? Um, well, I'm involved with Rules of Nonprofit, and I was out there looking for kind of tips and tactics, what's worked for other people in terms of crowdfunding. Okay. What else? What else do people want to learn about? make the most professional campaign or, or try to do your best to make it uh, be the most successful? Perfect. Okay. What else do people want to hear? What yeah. happens when your campaign chokes? Uh, and other platforms outside of kind of an evaluation of other platforms outside of uh, the kingpins. Because I imagine there's some aimed at nonprofits and so on. Ooh, excellent. Yeah, we'll uh, Let's address that because we could do a quick brainstorm on other platforms people <coughs> see. Yes? So you crowdfunded, how do you maintain momentum post Maintain momentum post post funding. Perfect. And keep it as as everybody in here is hearing these, be thinking about your own answers, because this isn't about us, it's about everyone chipping in. So some of the some of the service providers yeah. that could help you along the way. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Pitfalls with those. Yeah. What happens when you run out of crowdfunding? What happens when you run out of money? Exactly. Crowd. It's all about money, Kurt. <laughs> I'd like to hear some horror stories. Oh, case studies. No, it's only perfection in this room, so. <laughs> or stories. There is no failure. No. But, uh, crowdfunding and, and fundraising and then ownership. Thank you. What else do we get? We tap up. So you've got some uh, absolute rock star resources up here that, uh, that I want you guys to, to tap into today and the, the collective wisdom of, of what's up here represents probably billions of dollars worth of transactions and 
a heck of a lot of insights over the last couple of decades on what has happened around capital formation. Because whether we're talking about even rewards-based or equity-based crowdfunding, this is all about getting money in to support a project or a business. And whether we're selling stock or pre-selling a product, it's all about getting that cash in on the front end. So I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves, but real quick so you can think about how you can tap into the resources up here as well. We have Marty from Fallon that is leading some very innovative ways to tap the service provider aspect of a crowdfunding campaign to be successful in your fundraise. We have John Roberts of New Council Partners, uh, a longtime uh, securities attorney and uh, specifically working at SEC issuing companies as inside counsel. We have Kevin Sprague, also a securities attorney and also a general counsel for a venture capital firm uh, called Crescendo Ventures. And he can give you more background there. Jeff Robbins, uh, uh, you may saw him with the, the Prana Pool, uh, Shark Tank, Prana Pool, trademark, right, Jeff? <laughs> so Jeff Robbins with Angel Pollination, investor himself, gatherer of angels, and also securities attorney that's also seen many transactions on the investment side and also putting together from a legal perspective. So with that being said, I'm going to just give a couple of slides and a couple of background to just say where we've come from and then let's talk about the future where we're going to go. So once again, if you don't know a lot about crowdfunding, there's a couple of uh, the events at Minibar, also here Tech.mn did a crowdfunding campaign, or a crowdfunding panel at their Midwest Capital Call. They've got uh, seven or eight hours of video out there. Here's an hour that we did on crowdfunding. So all this is available to you for free right online. So let's really quickly talk about where we've come from. Prior to 1933, which uh, some of the, the, the legal finance dorks refer to like the Securities Act of 33, prior to that point, you really had the opportunity to do whatever it takes to bring money into a project or a business. Joseph Pulitzer put an ad in his papers to bring money in to build the pedestal base for the Statue of Liberty. Um, you would often see advertisements like this in publications that would advertise for mining companies. And that's where we got some of the things like getting fleeced because of the Golden Fleece Company, um, Montezuma's Revenge, and uh, you know being able to invest in oil and gas deals. But before 1933, it was really up to the states to really have any influence on what could be done. But there was no really federal oversight. And because of the Great Depression, the crash in the markets, that's where we had the birth of the SEC and really the, the foundation of the rules and regulations that we're faced with today. You may not care about that, but at the end of the day, that's the framework in which really allows us to be able to advertise and to be able to do things to tell people about bringing money into our business. So, you know, the, the entrepreneurs and all of us, and even the attorneys, really hate the fact that there's such legal quagmires, but, but that's what we're faced with. So, where we've been over the last 80 years, and John, you just referenced the, uh, the birth of the SEC, I think, 80 years ago. Um, it's really all about disclosure and the penalties that can happen if disclosure isn't done appropriately. So if you look at 1956 when Medtronic got started, and a huge uh, thank you to Kevin Spring for, for sharing this document. It's an 11-page document uh, when Medtronic raised some of its first money. Uh, raising $215,000 back in 1956 to get started. And I've heard stories of how they used to literally go door to door, you know, soliciting investors to, to put money in. 11 page document for disclosures. And now we move into 2013 where the average company that's filing to a public is pushing well over 200 pages in a prospectus to disclose risk doc disclosures and, and talk about their business. So that's very much on a public company side, but don't, don't be mistaken, it affects all of us. It's, it's, it affects everybody because it's all about the belief in the amount of disclosure when you're bringing money into your business when you're selling stock. So we'll, we'll mix a little bit of the equity and the rewards-based crowdfunding and just talk about fundraising in general. So with that being said, we want to talk about the future. We have lots of exciting platforms out there, peer-to-peer -peer lending, Kickstarters, AngelList. We're happy to talk about all this, but we're here today to give tactical advice on what you can do for what your specific needs are. 
So let's talk about the tactics to efficiently access capital and being able to do so without getting into trouble. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to share a few minutes about their own insights, uh, their points of view, where things have come from and where they're going. And we'll set the stage to begin the dialogue. And because we're being filmed, we'll just uh, have to pass this back and forth. So, yeah, we'll we'll do it like that. Yep. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Marty Weatherall. I work at Fallon, which is an advertising agency in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, it was started back in 1981, and we are a full service brand agency, which means that for many years we've been making TV commercials and print ads and radio commercials and billboards, and then in more recent history, we've started making banner ads and websites and uh, tweeting and doing all the kind of the, the new frontier of digital advertising. Um, and we do it all, we're full service. Uh, the reason I'm up here today is because uh, I'm the director of innovation there. I came from producing TV commercials and I started getting excited about all the new opportunities and things we could be doing as advertisers. And uh, last summer I was listening to uh, a podcast called This Week in Startups and they were interviewing Tobias Ludke, who is the founder of Shopify. And uh, he's an expert on the, the disruption of retail. And he said, um, what, do, what do you think is important about Kickstarter? Um, and he said, it's not crowdfunding. That's not the most important thing. Everyone thinks it's that. Everyone thinks it's about raising money, but it's not. The most important thing is that it forces somebody who wants to make something to make a video explaining what it is and why it absolutely needs to happen in the world. The video is sort of an accidental thing that Kickstarter and those platforms created, but it's, it's become the most important thing. When I heard that, I said, well, we've been making videos for a long time, and meanwhile, all these exciting projects are coming out of crowdfunding. It's giving a chance for so many more projects that never had a chance before to go on their own and communicate to the world what it was, what it is, and what it wants to be, and why. Um, but they need a good story. They need to talk, they need to explain themselves well in a video, they need a video that's going to communicate well, they need to communicate well on their page, they need to have a good strategy with respect to who they're talking to, what are their reward levels, because Kickstarter, as Patrick mentioned, is rewards based. So um, that was the uh, precipitous moment of uh, an effort that has resulted in what we're calling Fallon Starter Kit, which is, uh, there's a, a, a form that we have up on our site, it's fallon.com slash starter kit, and you can apply to have Fallon help you create your crowdfunding campaign, and that includes concepting and, and producing your video and writing your page copy, uh, getting all the stuff that's for, for your campaign ready before you launch, and then helping guide you with strategy and ideas for once you've launched for those 30 days or 60 days or whatever it is to keep the momentum going and make sure that the people that are back to you are happy and continue to be happy and spread the word. Um, and so that's why I'm up here. Uh, I was involved with the Travail Restaurant Kickstarter campaign last fall, which was a record-setting restaurant Kickstarter campaign. Uh, and that was sort of the test case that allowed us to get into crowdfunding or get into the starter kit offering. And I will say lastly, before I forget, um, we are helping crowdfunding projects at no upfront fee. So the, you know, how could we ever get involved in this? Well, we're not asking for any upfront fee like we do with all of our other clients. We will seek on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for the projects that we choose to work with uh, to take uh, some sort of success-based compensation based on how your crowdfunding raise goes. And so that opens the door to a lot more projects. Go ahead and introduce yourself, John. Do you want to rebut anything he had to say? Or you oh, I actually met Marty a few months ago. Uh, well, my name is John Roberts. Uh, we have a small law firm, there's just three of us, and all we do is tech startups. Um, and uh, so our clients, of course, are using just about every method possible to try to raise money. Um, and, uh, you know, again, listening to the, I think, the, the, the enthusiasm you can kind of hear here, uh, I would uh, be cautious. So we're still very early on. There's a bunch of things going on that you should be aware of. Uh, certainly, on the Kickstarter perspective, we're starting to see the first signs of lawsuits. Uh, I don't think there's going to be any doubt that Kickstarter people will be sued for not performing. Um, and so the, the lawyers, I don't know, we're probably up to about 2002 as far as figuring out what the legal issues are related to the internet and the digital world. 
So we'll kind of catch up with that. So I think there's going to be more of that. So I, again, I'd be somewhat cautious about what you're putting in your video, uh, what you're saying as part of your campaign. And of course, uh, you're entering into a contract with the people who give you $5 to get that cap dongle. So, uh, you know, again, make sure that you're willing to comply with that, uh, uh, you know, with that contract. Because I think that is something, again, it's been burbling up a little bit on the East Coast, and we'll see some more of that. As far as the equity side, uh, the world is uh, far from over on what it's going to mean to do that, how it's going to work, and what are the legal ramifications. Certainly, if you followed, uh, during the Jobs Act, any of the testimony that took place, uh, man, the SEC came out strongly against it. Uh, basically, they said that it was undoing 80 years of legislation and action by the SEC and the Department of Justice to protect investors. So, uh, again, I don't, I don't think that SEC is not going to be taking a close look at how all of this rolls out and what they do. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? No, but it just probably means you should be you know, somewhat careful about it. And I think, uh, from a practical perspective, too, when thinking about any of these things, uh, I think a lot of people get some type of general idea, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if I could raise 100,000 bucks and, and have, you know, get, get uh, 1,000, 100 people to give me 1,000 bucks each. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, you don't want 100 shareholders when you're a startup. That's just all there is to it. Uh, and, you know, you probably don't want seven or eight. You want to go out and raise your first 150 to 500,000 in angel funding and hopefully have two or three investors. Uh, again, Minnesota history, that's one thing we probably should talk about. It's been, you know, again, if you look at the last 30 years where we've gone from uh, periods where we uh, lawyers like to uh, crank up these 70 page private placement memorandums. You two, I'm sure, worked a few of those. And, uh, and then that would enable people to partner sometimes with a brokerage firm and go off and sell to hundreds of people. Well, knowing a couple of CEOs that had 350 investors, you do not, you do not want to be there for an underfunded, undercapitalized company. Uh, so again, you have to think about all those things. Yes, it's cool to raise money. Maybe that's the only way you can, uh, you can succeed. But I think that's part of the strategy, too, thinking that through. There is a, a ton of angel money out there right now. So you might not have to go through any of these uh, platforms. Again, uh, the angels are out there. They all made 30% on the stock market, stock market last year. Maybe they didn't, haven't done so well the last three months, but their sugar beet land uh, prices have gone up to 12,500 bucks an acre, so they still have cash. So again, I absolutely should you think about every possible means of raising money? Well, yeah, of course, but I would use some caution. And again, uh, I think working with people who can uh, you know, help you uh, figure out how to describe your business, and uh, particularly when you're, when you're raising equity, uh, uh, I think that's you know, a key thing. Wow, I don't really have a whole lot to say after that, John. Now, I, I'm Kevin Spring, I'm an attorney with Fredrickson and Byron. Um, I completely agree with what John said. I think that, um, I'll be interested to hear what Jeff has to say about this, but I think as far as fundraising, selling equity uh, on the, you know, online, I, I, I don't hold, hold out a lot of hope for it. I think things like Kickstarter are very interesting and provide an opportunity to raise money through pre-sales. I also actually on the side have an electric bicycle company, Defiant Bicycles. Check it out online, defiantbicycles.com. It is, uh, and we did a uh, crowdfunding project on crowd supply. It was an abysmal failure. The, um, the things that we found kind of in hindsight that didn't work out is, one, our team wasn't really organized around, uh, around the social media and driving people to the site. We had a poorly prepared video that I think Marty can help you with now, it sounds like. And I, I, you know, so I, I, I think you know, my advice on actually doing crowdfunding, coming from the perspective of somebody who's tried it and failed, is, you know, go into it very, very well organized. You know, it, it is a campaign. Go into it uh, understanding that it's going to be, you know, it's, it's a full-time job, and you should really, uh, you should really go into it with the, with a lot
lot of front end loading. So when you when you when your campaign goes live, you want to have a bunch of people who are immediately going on and uh, and, and buying. Um, kind of so like having an anchor investor in a, in a it, regular it, it, deal. Exactly, exactly. So that's uh, that's my two cents. Damn good sets of two senses. So that's uh, six cents across, across there, and I and I, I agree with uh, with all of it. So I just want to make sure that everybody you know does understand this this legal framework between the Kickstarter kind of thing and the Jobs Act kind of thing, because it's kind of important to understand that the easiest way to think about this is that a security, which is the thing that the three three of us uh, at this side of the table kind of deal with from a law perspective. The easiest way to think about it is, is an investment of money or something of value in a common enterprise with the expectation of profits to be derived solely or principally through the efforts of others. And what Kickstarter does is it kills the third, uh, the third element. There's no profit motivation. Either the only reason that people are giving you money is essentially either because they like you or because they're trying to get a product or service from you. They aren't trying to make a profit. The ultimate, of course, of that now is what Oculus uh, VR where I think there's a lot of people who feel essentially duped, right? They, they, uh, they, they got themselves a, a lousy version of a, of a first-tier first version of a developer product that they have to figure out what to do with, and the company, meanwhile, sold itself for a billion five to, uh, um, you know, to Facebook. So in that case, all the people who participated in the crowdfunding campaign got nothing for it. They had no profit motivation. I bet they are thinking that they wish they had that nowadays. Um, so, you know, I, I, the, the interesting anomaly it creates is, is that the JOBS Act, has played, uh, as, as the regulations are proposed, it's not law yet, to allow you to publicly crowdfund, is a limited amount of money with a bunch of disclosure with, uh, frankly, if you're raising more than $100,000, you got to get accountants involved and you want to raise more than a half a million, a million, you need audited financial statements. I mean, you don't need any of this stuff if you're going on Kickstarter. You don't have to do a disclosure document. You don't have to do any reporting with the SEC. All these things that are lined up to come into the new crowdfunding rules. And with Kickstarter, you don't get any of that. So that's why it's the Wild West. It's really kind of strange that, in effect, uh, the government, um, uh, in its in its quest to um, you know protect uh, protect investors has essentially left wide open uh, you know the lack of protection entirely in, in terms of Kickstarter so that's kind of uh, you know, kind of interesting but look at the campaigns that are really you know really successful um, you know there's one right now that's just wrapping up uh, that uh, Neil Young has for a portable music player called Pono Music I happen to be big into the audio stuff so I keep backing those kinds of campaigns and. Um, you know, he spent a year in advance of starting the campaign doing the circuit on the talk shows and whatever, showing prototypes and this and that. And, you know, so now they've raised something like uh, about $6 million, I think is where they're at now, um, you know, on, on that campaign inside of 30 days and, you know, from, from selling products. So it certainly demonstrates that. The other thing that Kickstarter tends to do is it's, it's a magnet for the venture investors. So take, for example, the local company uh, SmartThings. Uh, you know, started by uh, Ben Edwards, who's one of the co-founders of the very event you're at at Minibar. Um, so they did a very successful crowdfunding, you know, campaign, which on the back end of it, they got a substantial amount of venture capital because the VC investors basically said, okay, well, if they can attract that much money as pre-purchase a product, this is obviously something that people are really interested in. So uh, I, I think you can kind of look at it, you know, two-staging kind of process, but, you know, uh, in January, at a conference that I was at, the SEC said they, that it is a priority to get these regulations out on public crowdfunding before the end of the year. Maybe we'll see it, maybe we won't, but I don't think it's going to be very helpful for, uh, you know, for any of you. Now, you do know we can do public crowdfunding for uh, the rich people of the world, for accredited investors. The reality is, is that I think it's hard to get uh, accredited investors from... Yeah, so in the credit investor, you know, it, I, I think of them as the rich people, but the easiest way to think about it is, is million dollars net worth exclusive of the value of your residence, or individual income in each of the last two years of 200000 and you expect to accomplish that this, this year, or joint income with your spouse of 300000 in each of the last two years and expecting to reach that objective this year. So if, you're, if your focus of your fundraise is just with those kind of people, the securities laws have more limited requirements to go with them, and they also, under the Jobs Act now, you can publicly solicit for those kinds of people under some certain parameters and rules around that. 
I don't see a lot of action happening in that, to be very honest. And I assume probably most of the most of the group here has has not. But that is currently the uh, the law. And I think it's frankly because the wealthier investors would rather privately connect into an interesting opportunity and hear about it, notwithstanding the fact that we did it publicly, you know, for all of you to watch at uh, at Piranha Pool earlier today. Um, so. Um, so I think that you know the the crowdfunding concept. I, I really look at it as uh, Marty's skill set is absolutely critical and essential. And you hear Kevin saying he wishes he'd hired him, you know, to help on, on on his own campaign. But a successful crowdfunding campaign can be your leverage to bigger money with uh, with equity investors. Yeah, do, you, do you agree that? Um, do you agree? So do. But do you, do you agree that equity crowdfunding is not going to be a great success as compared to Kickstarter? I don't think it's going to be anywhere near the success that Kickstarter's been. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I suspect... Yeah, no, that's certainly right. I, just, I don't even think it's worth thinking about that. Think, think, think of it that way. Um, and it's just because, you know, the, between the SEC and the state regulators, they've thrown so many different bells and whistles into what ultimately is the law, that the regulations are constrained by what the law is, and it's just not going to create anything that's practical for you folks to be able to use to go out there and really raise money. Yeah, we hand, in the, uh, hand the microphone over here. Let's go real quick. We make a joke all the time that people are probably going to have to do a rewards-based crowdfunding campaign to just raise enough money to afford to do an equity-based crowdfunding campaign because of the costs that will be involved. And that's what I was going to try to clarify. As somebody who's been had my own startup for some time and, and uh, in, in the software space, um, and now looking at all this interesting activity happening in, in crowdfunding on sites like Kickstarter, well, how do you decide which is right for you? I think if you've got an interesting strategy, a viable strategy of rewards, maybe it's advanced purchase if it's a, if it's a hardware item, uh, can you sell it in advance and actually prove your market via a Kickstarter campaign? Or is it a in software, it can be trickier. What you know, maybe it's going to be a free app. How can you give rewards to people that it, that aren't equity if you're trying to generate money to build a an output that's eventually going to be a free app? That's a little bit harder. So as you as you look at your options, I think do you have rewards that you could actually, if you raise this money, fulfill either by spending some of that money that you've raised, or even better, if there's things that are kind of scalable but don't even eat into that. Maybe you're giving a seminar or something nice enough to back your campaign. So I think the reward thing is the key differentiator as to your strategy of crowdfunding, if you guys want to Marty, tell people a little bit about your own startup and your own Well, uh, fanchatter.com is a startup that I've had for quite some time, and I was a member of Y Combinator back in the summer of 2009. It wasn't a great season for raising um, venture funding back then. Uh, times have been up and down since then. I've never had, personally, a lot of luck uh, with what I was doing with my startup in attracting venture money, but it was always designed to be something. It initially was a, a consumer website, and then it became a, a B2B um, play, and so we've kind of kept it going by bootstrapping, essentially. So bootstrapping is another option, of course, if you can kind of get something built and just sort of have it pay for itself. Um, but if you're looking for an infusion of cash, I personally believe that crowdfunding has just barely scratched the surface of the potential of it. It is purely the evolution of marketing. I think, what better way, why go out on a limb and try to raise money to build something that you don't even know if people want yet, when you can actually build one prototype, make a video about it, and test the market. And you don't have to extend yourself any further than that. If the, if the market responds and you're there to keep up with them, then you make it. The Indiegogo, which is another site that uh, is right there with Kickstarter, um, and they have far fewer rules than Kickstarter, by the way, but uh, people talk about the Pebble Watch, which I'm wearing, as the highest raising Kickstarter campaign of all time, over $10 million. Um, the Ubuntu phone project uh, was recently an Indiegogo pro uh, campaign. And they raised, I think, 13 or $14 million. But their goal was, I believe, $33 million or $35 million. So that's another thing to make sure everyone understands. It. Uh, on Kickstarter and, and sometimes on Indiegogo, if you don't meet your goal, you don't get any of the money. But the Ubuntu people were happy. They said, you know, even though we raised $13 million, we're happy that we didn't reach our goal because it saved us all the effort. Because if we would have raised the $30 million that we needed to make these things and not sold enough of them, we would have been in deep trouble. So they were thankful that Indiegogo helped them prove or disprove that there was enough of a market.
market for that product. Well, that's a good point too, which is, uh, you know, okay, what are you going to do with your spare 110 percent of your time? Uh, again, <laughs> do uh, work with Marty on a video, or are you going to spend your time working on the code, or are you going to go spend 50 hours doing the uh, Minnesota Cup? I don't know. You know, those are hard decisions to make. Uh, but, you know, again, I think if you, like, if, okay, if you're going to test out a concept, maybe it, does, maybe it does make sense. But I think you have to be very, very careful about how you use your time. Because, again, the old saying is 110% on product development and 110% on raising money. So, uh, I think it's a good thing to keep in mind, uh, is this stuff a waste of time? Because if you are selling to accreditors, boy, it's pretty easy. Uh, you know, it's a 12-slide 12, 12 uh, PowerPoint. A term sheet, you know, and some uh, contribution agreements. So uh, again, it it looks it looks very interesting. I think it is very interesting, uh, but uh, there's a there's a lot of money out there, and uh, you don't necessarily have to go through these. And again, sure, Indiegogo, uh, one of my favorite clients, this really brilliant woman in uh, Cincinnati who's a software engineer, uh, you know, undergrad, Carnegie Mellon, Master Science, Computer Science. Craig Mellon, she just completed her cat book uh, deal on Indiegogo, and again, it's amazing. She raised twenty-five thousand bucks in two weeks about the three cats in her life that uh, help catch a robber in the neighborhood, which is fine. So Kickstarter has a lot of good purposes, and the smart thing still, uh, I don't know if Scott's not here, Steve. Yeah, they did raise two million. It was a brilliant campaign. Uh, they'll tell you though, uh, they'll be honest with you and say, when it came time to deliver on some of the devices, it was a lot of work. So again, two million bucks, yeah, of course it was worthwhile, and of course it led to, to the larger venture round. But I think you need to think all those things through as you decide which route to take to raise the money. Did you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought it was interesting to, I just learned about the, the failure of Spark that kind of led to their success, you know, and, and how they, they changed their product scope to, to align with the, the maker community. And if, if you've seen a lot of that space in these crowdfunding, have you seen other failures that have led to better success? Absolutely. Um, one example that I know of, uh, uh, a toy that um, has sort of a Star Wars theme. Um, uh, within one hour of launching, it's ultimately unsuccessful crowdfunding campaign, Kickstarter campaign back in January, was contacted by Hasbro. Um, because Hasbro has the Lucasfilm rights and they're getting ready for the new wave of films. And that campaign ultimately did not reach its goal and was a failure, but they're now in talks with Hasbro because they just got out on that stage. It's a giant stage. It's a new marketing frontier. And um, just by being out there, regardless of how, there's another uh, local project that um, was doing a, uh, a smart connected barbecue smoker called the Q-Box. They ended up canceling their campaign because they realized they weren't going to hit their goal, but they were contacted by several companies in the barbecue manufacturing space about working with them. So you're going, it's kind of like you're going live in the world. Your crowdfunding page is essentially the ultimate press kit. There's a video that any news publication can embed on their site. There's quotes all over your page that they can pull from. There's photographs if you supply with photographs. Um, and so it's like a press kit that you're putting on the world and you may end up raising the money but you may end up getting contacted in other ways. And um, I believe that, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, there's more than just the money that could be a uh, benefit. And in some cases, it's not getting the money that teaches you the ultimate lesson, which is you, you should iterate like Spark did. Spark started with a connected light product, um, and they set their goal pretty high, I believe. Uh, um, 250,000, I believe. Uh, originally, and they raised 125, I think, and then they, you got it, uh, and then uh, and then they came back with a goal of ten thousand dollars for their their new offering. They raised uh, five hundred thousand dollars off that. So, um. so and then real quick, my story. I did a crowdfunding campaign for my medical product, and it was of low our expectations. And we had one backer who ran the hemophilia clinic at the U of L. That led to us over the coming months to get into half the hemophilia clinics in the United States because of that one. So these campaigns go way beyond just the dollars that come in. Yep. Yeah, I just have a question. I have, I have a software product that I'm looking to fund, but I also have some experience in the bill making side. And it's an interesting perspective here because I've been working with, I 
I've worked with filmmakers, and on the filmmaking side, um, there's this expectation that you support a, a, a film, an artistic thing, and you don't require anything back. I mean, I've funded, I've, done, I've supported stuff. So how does that play on the software and the entrepreneurial side? And you know, one thing too that, like last year, I think that Kickstarter raised more money than the National Endowment for the Arts. That's right. So there's all this kind of like, do you think people will just fund a two hundred thousand dollar Kickstarter for a software thing and not expect anything in return? Or are you guys well, just to support the community or nobody's doing that or it's a reward strategy is critical. If you're gonna get into the rewards based crowdfunding space, not the equity based, but what are the rewards? And I spoke last hour about this very thing. If the rewards are worth it, Spike Lee just crowdfunded his next film. And a lot of people were upset. Why is Spike Lee kickstarting? He should have enough money. He should be able to get the money he needs. He's Spike Lee. But he raised, I believe it was $3 million or something. And his rewards were full of all these sort of things that he had in his attic. You know, these, these posters from Malcolm X and posters from Do the Right Thing. And he signed this and he signed that. And then he had screenings. And those rewards were worth it to enough people to go to a screening that he was going to be at. So software, I've seen some software projects that would be difficult for a free software application to crowdfund, but, but they get creative and they offer a chance to meet them, meet the founders or whatever. And so if you can get really creative with what the reward structure is, because there have to be rewards, even arts projects, you get your name in the credits or something, right? Are those worth it to enough people? And that, that, then you let the market decide. It's, it's ultimately letting the market decide if your rewards are really worth it. If you can figure that out, I think crowdfunding is interesting in a lot of ways. And then the one other thing I want to make sure I mention is that when people back your campaign, you think you've got to handle people that follow you on Twitter or like you on Facebook or something. But when they've actually put money behind your campaign, now that's a very engaged group. And that's where the post-launch campaign management and the post-campaign management come in because now you've got this email list of people who are really rooting for you. They're actually helping to enable your success. Uh, and you can learn a lot from them. The great smart thing story was they created their entire product roadmap by asking their backers, what do you wish was smarter? And they got hundreds of thousands of answers back and they figured out what they should be doing based on the people that had backed their campaign. And that community would not have existed if they were just used their own money to build their first prototype and try to get it to market. One question. Marty, it seems like you're very optimistic about what is now Yeah, I mean, do, you, do some of you envision like yeah. crowdfunding to be very different or very? Well, not to, to, be, to be clear, he's talking about rewards based, okay. and what, what we're, and I think we're all kind of, you know, think that might be what is successful. It is the sale of a security, the equity, crowdfunding that we are not so. Uh, yeah. So if you're trying, if you're trying to give away a piece of the company. You know, you know, and give people pro a profit motive to own a, 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 own a piece of the company. That's the part of it that we don't think works very well. There's too much regulation about selling stock or LLC interests in your company in a crowdfunding format, as opposed to doing pre-sales of products or rewards. And, and the occipital example, I wanted to reference that too. I'm sorry, not occipital. Um, Oculus. Yeah. So uh, for everyone, Oculus Rift started on Kickstarter, and they just got acquired by Facebook for Two million. And there were some people saying, how do the Kickstarter backers feel about that? Well, the Kickstarter backers got whatever reward that they were they had coming to them. And if they didn't, they should be mad. Because sometimes Kickstarter campaigns get funded and then the rewards never happen. And that's where we get into some of the difficulty. Because you ultimately have to trust these people at their word that if, if the campaign hits its goal and they get your money, that they're going to fulfill. But as long as the Oculus rewards were filled, it might have been sort of an early prototype version. But those people were never promised equity. They were backing a project, trying to help it get off the ground in exchange for whatever that reward was that they thought was worth it. And I think that should have been the expectation for me. So, yeah, that was the expectation, of course. Um, say I'm a, I'm a sort of founder, uh, entrepreneur, um, and I would just be so excited if I could get my Kickstarter backers uh, a split of like 3% of the company or something like that. Now, why wouldn't Oculus Prime, or Oculus, um, be excited about that too? I mean, be able to give somebody, every one of their backers, another 15 grand or something all of a sudden? I mean, what a story. Why is that money slowed down so much? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, actually what takes us back to 1933. <laughs> <laughs> so, so karma is an acceptable crowdfunding uh, reward then. You, you be the judge. But I mean, if, if that's what you're going to
você. This is why I think it's such an exciting space for marketers. So typically in advertising, we've been selling products that exist. All of a sudden, this slight shift in context, where we're making videos and telling stories about products that don't exist yet, but with your help, they could exist. All of a sudden, you're involving people in a way where they're not just being asked to buy something, but asked to support something that may or may not happen without your help. And so there is a karmic element. That's why the people tend to get upset with Spike Lee. Like, he could make his film anyway. Why should I back that? Well, enough people overcame that and decided that the rewards and the karma and whatever it was made sense. But I think for all of a sudden, you know, who cares about banner ads? But people will go and browse Kickstarter and Indiegogo. They're both ads. They're both collections of ads. But these ads are asking you to get involved in a meaningful way. And that's very powerful, at least for now. I mean, times change, but. Well, it's, it's, of course. Uh... Okay, putting the legal issues aside, you know, obviously, uh, wh whether you're talking about Spike Lee, you know, why did Spike Lee do this? Spike Lee didn't. Spike Lee had been put in a position for every other movie where maybe he got some small percentage on the back end after all the expenses had been paid and all the producers and everyone and the investors had been made. This gives him a little more control over his financial destiny, no question. Yeah, it's been creative. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, uh, you know, the music industry, uh, if you remember the download, uh, the radio had, you know, uh, was it pay your own, pay your own deal? Yeah, you know, one to ten bucks, and they, they got to control distribution, they got to, and they got to take more profit out. And again, <laughs> yes, it's great to sell karma, and you get some excited people, but it's also nice to get money that you don't have to give up any part of your equity for. Let's, let's face it, two million bucks? And not have to give a penny over, get a get a share away. Wow, that's all I can say about that. As long as you plan to fill those rewards whenever they end up being. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that that fulfilling award, but rewards thing is is an important thing. So I'll take an example of a campaign that that I backed another uh, another audio campaign of a uh, of a company, and so their their first product that they were crowdfunding uh, was a, a a digital to analog. Company. Headphone combination thing, USB thing that plugs into your uh, plugs into your computer, and um, so they they planned to launch the product and show it at the Consumer Electronics Show in January, and indeed yeah, they they did. Um, and uh, but what they and, and their intention was the week that they got back from CES was to ship the product out to everybody. But what they found out while they were at CES is that the USB connector into the computer uh, at, when it was in there for a long period of time started to say and um, and they realized that this was a design defect in how the thing had been manufactured over in China. Well now they suddenly had a big delay they were going to have um, and a workaround to be able to go back and remanufacture product and they had you know 1,500, 2,000 people who are uh, all wondering what's going on and writing them all kinds of notes and they're having to put out, I mean they're communicating like every day about the process by which they're going over to China and how they're divvying up the work and, and uh, how they're doing the workaround and where they are in the workaround process. I mean, this is the kind of visibility into uh, you know into things you never see with a typical you know typical company. Um, uh, now that product is is now out and being shipped, and I might be be waiting for me when I get home today. But um, and I've backed them on two other campaigns, so we'll we'll see how they do on their next stuff behind it. But I, you know, I guess the point is, is it can be very complicating if it doesn't work out exactly the way that it's supposed to. And uh, and this is just people who have voluntarily given you the money. You can only imagine if you had that many people who actually owned a piece of your company, which is what you heard John earlier saying it would be a disaster to have hundreds of, or thousands of, of shareholders in a very, uh, a very young company. The, and I guess to be clear is that on, on Kickstarter, there are people getting sued now for not delivering. Absolutely. I mean, and there, there are a bunch of them. That doesn't Yeah. 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 The Kickstarter and, is the term to say that they're not. Well, well okay. okay. Yeah, Kickstarter's not. Right. Okay. Okay. And so the, the other thing I was going to add is in, in our, uh, for Defiant, um, in our campaign, the number of emails that we received, and we, remember, we didn't successfully close. The number of emails that we received from people wondering where their product was. I mean, it, was, it was an effort just to keep up with responding to people before we actually even closed our campaign, campaign. 
and our email is basically backward. This is the way it works. We don't get anything until we complete it. And, and so it's, you know, and if, if we would have actually closed the campaign, people would have bought bikes and, and, and t-shirts and the other rewards that we had, and we weren't able to deliver. I mean, it, I, I can just imagine being an enormous nightmare. The other thing I would say about that um, campaign experience is that we had an article written in a Hungarian newspaper and online. We had an article written in Belize. And it's just like the, the stuff just comes out of the woodwork uh, about it. And so it, in, in the end, we were really happy that you know we didn't successfully close because you know, I, think, I think we were looking for $45,000 just because it's, I mean, we were doing it more for PR than for selling the product. So it, it ended up working out all right for us. But it, it's uh, it's an interesting experience, and you just shouldn't you shouldn't underestimate how much time and effort it's going to be. Anybody else? So th this gentleman uh, came to speak at the Midwest Capital Call. So th their comments were pretty interesting. But here's an example of a horror story, where they put out a campaign on Kickstarter, actually didn't want to raise the money, and raised four hundred thousand for a fifty thousand dollar goal. None of the people had any manufacturing experience, had any business experience and they scrambled. And that campaign closed in August of 2012. They're now just shipping product. And if you want to read some uh, very volatile comments, it's pretty entertaining to pull this up and uh, to see how Oscar got treated through this whole process. So. Do you know if there's ever been any B2B uh, activity on Kickstarter, or is it all consumer product? There, I, I get asked this question quite often. There is some examples of B2B, but the problem that you keep facing is that the rewards can be very difficult. And so there are people who've tried to pull off things where they're giving away t-shirts or they're giving away other things and they're, they're treating that, that B equation as a human on the other end, like who could be actually buying this thing. But those are pretty hard to pull off and the examples are pretty few and far between unless somebody else here has seen something in the B2B space. Um, the one thing to keep in mind, we, we encourage people not to give up on the idea around B2B because if you're doing crowdfunding right, the way I like to think about crowdfunding is there's no such thing as a failure because this is really you know, what Marty does for a living. This is all about really raising awareness and if you do crowdfunding right, it's really cheap if not free or even get paid for advertising. It's, you got to really think about this as a way to go promote yourself and your brand. Is there a, um, outside of Kickstarter, there hasn't been a specific B2B platform, has there? Yeah, I, offline I could give you a couple examples that I know of, but none that I know have been really successful. Yeah, there's there's five more calls. Yeah. I would uh, just reiterate the, the ingenuity in the reward structure. So there was one project I was talking to, and we were just really thinking long and hard about, okay, this is B2B, but how can we make this work? Maybe, you know, if, if you want the business entity in your area to have this, you know, back the project, then we'll let the, that business entity in your area know that X number of people backed our project in your area. So you could think about ways to sort of allow people to almost like vote for their hometown to get the solution, if you will. Just one sort of generic version of how a B2B might figure that out, but it, it just takes time kind of thinking through it and really deciding what is what can you actually put out on this page on the internet that people would actually want and believe in and, and want to get behind. So it is 3.30 and I, we need to wrap up so we can be respectful of the next group coming in. Uh, I believe there would be somebody in here. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the panel is available, so this obviously is minute bar, so come up and, and chat and so forth. But the person that asked about nonprofit crowdfunding real quick, uh, Rally.org and Razu, which backs Give.mn. Not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, ooh, boy. No, I didn't know that. Okay. Well, yeah. they, they, just they just changed. Okay. So there's very, the, the punchline is there's some very specific platforms. And for Kurt, who left in the middle of this, asked about other platforms, um, there are platforms that are available for basically anything. They're getting very specific on the platforms that you know, uh, veteran-owned businesses and so forth that are very specific platforms. So if there's things that you're looking for, uh, quick Google searches can, can yield quite a crop of insights. I'll just put in a plug for, if it's a hardware project, Dragon Innovation mm, yes. out of Boston. Uh, they actually helped 
Pebble, uh, fulfill all those Pebble watches they sold. And he started with the Roomba, I believe, a professor who, who understands what it takes to go to China and produce at scale. And they've actually launched their own crowdfunding platform now. And in terms of being trustworthy when you crowdfund, the hardware, I think, because hardware is very hard, um, if they accept you on their crowdfunding platform, which actually costs, I believe, $5,000 just to crowdfund on their platform, but now you've been endorsed. But to be you know, well taken care of after you are successful, um, these guys bring a lot of uh, credibility in that regard. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. And once again, there's plenty of resources.